Hello, everyone. My name is Molly Halsey, and I'm the event specialist here at EDB. I will be your host today for our webinar, New and Improved Features and PostgreSQL 13. I'm joined by Mark Linster, Chief Technical Technology Officer, Rusha Blathia, Database Architect and Director of Product Development, and Bruce Mongen, Co-Founder of PostgreSQL Global Development Group and Database Architect at EDB. Before we get started, there are just a couple housekeeping items I want to go over. This presentation is being recorded. We will be sharing the recording along with the slides after the broadcast. The lines are currently needed. If you have a question, please feel free to submit it in the question panel. Today's session is scheduled for one hour. We expect the presentation to last most of our time and we'll allot any extra time for Q&A. If we do not have time to address all questions, we will follow up afterwards by posting the answers on the EDB website on the webinar page. So to jump in today, we have a quick poll to get started. The first poll is what version of PostgreSQL or advanced server are you currently running? Your options are version 12, version 11, version 10, version 9.6, or a version outside of that. I'll give everyone a couple of seconds to answer. We've already had over 50% of the audience vote already within the first 20 seconds. Um, I'll give everyone about 10 more seconds to take part before we reveal the results. We are almost at 70% of everyone voting. I'll give it another few seconds and I will reveal the results right now. Now that is, that's, that's amazing, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm surprised. Yeah, we we typically see a balance uh, quite the other way, uh, where we we tend to have a lot of companies that that are you know usually two if not more years behind. Um, and here it really looks like uh, the majority or the largest number is is actually current. And if you if you add up eleven and twelve, it's uh, it's a significant majority that. Uh, that is on on near current releases. That's uh, that is very very interesting. All right, so I will hand this presentation over to Mark right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, so share my screen here. Okay. Okay, so let me just. Uh, Okay, so the way we're going to do this today is we're going to talk about PostgreSQL new uh, new features, um, and uh, we're going to do a deeper dive into uh, Postgres Advanced Partitioning and also look at Postgres Advanced Server 13 new features. So just that uh, that we can give you an objective presentation of what's in the open source version, what did we EDB add to that, and did you get an understanding for? You know what's really what's the reasoning why we added those capabilities um so so let me first dive into the postgresql 13 new features now one thing that i want to emphasize here um we haven't run the benchmarks yet with 13 but um, um one of the things that everybody needs to understand is postgres has been successively getting faster and faster and faster the key message with this is that you know, if you've looked at Postgres four or five years ago, the Postgres of today is not your father's Postgres. Postgres of today has a lot more features, a lot more capabilities, and that's why we're going through this, but it is all, also has become significantly faster. What that means is that when you compare with 9.5, um, today Postgres 12 is, um, you know, 50%, 50% faster than what we had uh, a few years ago when we were peaking out at about on the PG bench test at about 28,000 TPS. And now we're getting at, uh, um, we're peaking out at a bit over 42,000 TPS and that all on the same machine. The other really important thing in here is that years ago, one was worried about finding exactly the right number of clients simultaneously connecting to the database because if you connected too many, then the overall TPS would go down rather dramatically. Now, in this benchmark here, we're seeing that 
the line today stays relatively flat. I'm sure there is a knee if you go further and to the right that there will be a, um, a decrease in performance if you completely overload the server with connection requests, but it's by far not as critical anymore as it used to be. So key thing is here, if you haven't looked at Postgres recently, take a look again, both from a, uh, a TPS capability as from a feature capability has really changed significantly. You know, Mark, I wonder if this explains why so many people are on more current versions. Because, you know, years ago you'd get on a version of Informix, a version of Oracle, and you sat there for three, five years because it was stable. It nothing really new came. Most of the new stuff that came was buggy, you know, from from the proprietary vendors. And takes a, it, there's a lag to people to realize that hey, I can stay on the current version of Postgres. I can, you know, go to that within three months of mm -hmm. final um, and I don't have the problem with buggy new features and instability and stuff and and there is so many improvements in each year that this graph kind of explains it and, and also we have even more scaling improvements in Postgres 14 I know you and I talked about that that capability coming so you know we're even we even know that 14 is going to be better than this chart you have right now yeah, and it's it's as Bruce said. If you think about it, it, that's an interesting interesting thought that you know the the fast move of new innovation is uh, is one of the drivers. Like if you and Rusha will talk about that in a bit more detail. If you think about the partitioning improvements, I mean, since ten declarative partitioning and then many more capabilities, parallel query uh, has been built out significantly. So there's real reasons to to move forward quickly. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting statistical result here. So, um, so speed is important, but it's not everything, right? So we'll talk briefly about, uh, you know, vacuum capabilities. Again, it has something to do with speed, with parallel query. Uh, we'll talk about security and consistency. We'll talk about, uh, you know, new partitioning capabilities. Now, this is only a small set of what's new. Uh, take a look at the release notes at postgresql.org for a complete picture. Um, so vacuum improvements. I think this is really, really interesting because we all know that vacuum and bloat is um, is something that especially especially new DBAs often run into that problem. And so what uh, uh, what the, the team under Amit Kapila did here is um, um, add a parallel vacuum capability for indexes um, into uh, into Postgres and that really that really does you know vacuum much much faster so here in this experiment here um, you know we had the, uh, a large number of a large amount of bloat was created and then on the single thread it took about 60 minutes to reduce to reduce that bloat but if you ran um, you know, parallel threads, you could eliminate that four times faster. So that's that's really a significant improvement. And again, that builds on the parallel, the parallel query engine that was introduced a few years ago. Um, okay. Oh, and then one more thing here, um, auto vacuum for append-only transactions. Now that sounds like a little technicality, but um, auto vacuum also recalculates the statistics. And that's really important for IoT type tables where you have, uh, you know, append only transactions. In the past, statistics weren't automatically regenerated. Now that happens all the time. So again, that's an important thing. Well, we, we had statistics, Mark. The big change is the index only scans. So marking, you can only do index only scans if a page is marked as all visible. Mm -hmm. And uh, previously, because you weren't deleting anything or updating anything with, with expired rows, we weren't in there marking things all visible. And that's ah. really what hit the append only tables. And mm -hmm. it's something that's been on my bugaboo list for a couple of years. I tried to fix it like in a simple way and I failed and Alexander Krotkov took a whack at it and finally, finally nailed it. So it's kind of a yeah. weird, weird case that, uh, you know, you think of vacuum only for cleaning and you think, oh, insert only, I don't need to clean, but but you actually do if you want to use index only scans. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, security and consistency. Um, 
you know, lip EQ channel binding, um, Im important, right? Stop middle, man in the middle attacks. And then, um, then we added new capabilities to PG cat check. And again, it's a little, it's a, it sounds like a little thing that every once in a while bugs a DVA when, you know, a file gets corrupted. Uh, PG cat check now uh, identifies whether you have, uh, you know, at least one data file for an existing relation. So if you have lots of data files, lots of gigs in that, in that relation, it can still happen that one of the later files, um, you know, is, is corrupted or, or just not available. But at least now with PG cat check, you can figure out whether a relation has at least, uh, at least one, um, uh, one file in it. And that addresses a, um, a very frequent issue that uh, that came up quite a bit. And uh, if you have more questions afterward, it was actually Rushab and his team that created this capability. So uh, uh, we can talk about that a little more, but that's really an important thing where you can run PG cat check now with uh, the, the new option dash dash select from relations. And that will check that uh, every relation has at least one readable file on disk. Um, okay, backup manifests also um, a new capability that now makes sure that uh, PG based backup writes a manifest that, uh, that has the list of the backup files, the checksums, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, there's a new, a new tool to help you verify that the backup is, uh, that ver verify backup integrity. So PG verify backup will do that for you. That's all part of a strategy to bring more and better backup capabilities into the core of the database. Okay, partition-wise join. Uh, again, partitioning been built up since, uh, uh, since Postgres 10 uh, as declarative partitioning. There was in, in, in 11, we introduced partition-wise join, but now in 13, one of the key limitations of the old implementation where the partition boundaries had to be the same, that has been removed, okay? So that again will make partition-wise join much, much more interesting. If you wanna learn more about this, uh, check out Postgres Vision 2020. Amit Langote talked about uh, uh, partitioning in Postgres uh, at great length. He um, was actually one of the authors of this capability. So. Uh, uh, check that out. Um, and then logical replication for partition tables. Again, you know, building out the capability here where you can now say, okay, uh, when you have a partition table and there's a logical replication operation, do, do does the data appear to come from the root partition or does it from the root or does it come from the uh, the child partitions or the individual partitions? So you now have a flag to, uh, to allow you to control that. And the interesting part about this is you can now replicate from non-partitioned to partitioned architectures and vice versa. So you could have a replica that uses a different architecture, for example, where, where you partition for uh, and optimize for, for insert or read and, um, and so you no longer bound to have exactly the same partition architecture in the uh, um, uh, on on both sides of a logical replication. So lots of advances there that are happening, but again, there's a lot more to the current release. So check out the release notes. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, uh, to Rusha, but I think we're having a another poll first, Molly. Is that right? Yes, we have one more poll. I'm launching it now. Your question is, are you using partitioning? Your options are yes, declarative, yes, inheritance-based, no, I am planning to use, or I have no plans. So already in the first 15 seconds, we already had over 40% of the audience answer. We're at 50% now. We'll give everyone a little bit more time to answer. We'll give it another five seconds. We're already at 65% of the audience voted. And I'm going to share the results. Yeah, that's um, it's actually not surprising, right? I mean, it's yeah. good to hear that most people use declarative partitioning, right? We had a 
I think a small contingent who said they were still on 9.6 uh, and earlier. So yeah, they had to use inher inheritance-based. Um, good. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Rishab now. Uh, you see my slides? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Uh, so yeah, when, when we talk about the Postgres and Enterprise DB uh, Postgres Advanced Server, so uh, Enterprise DB Postgres Advanced Server is a super set of Postgres SQL. It has all the capability and the features available in Postgres. Plus, it has their own proprietary features like native PLSQL compatibility, Oracle packages, autonomous transactions, hints, at resource manager, and many other features around that. So when we talk about EDB Postgres Advanced Server, it actually kind of a superset of Postgres SQL. Right, so uh, Mark said it correctly, like, uh, performance is not everything. There has been a lot of features which has been added into the Postgres SQL. Uh, that's something really amazing over the last couple of years. It's, it's been a huge improvement into the partitioning. Uh, apart from Postgres SQL, what amazed me a lot is like not only Postgres SQL is becoming powerful, but the ecosystem around the Postgres SQL is something getting more and more powerful. Uh, now, what exactly I mean by saying ecosystem? So, I mean like there are a lot of tools, utilities available to manage your Postgres SQL cluster. Uh, there are a lot of foreign data repos which is available now, which will allow you to talk with different data sources. So, yeah, that's something really amazing to uh, look like. It's it's really nice that uh, we have that ecosystem around the Postgres SQL. Uh, now, in the second part of this presentation, what I'll be uh, going to do is like we'll be doing a deep dive into the Postgres Advanced Server partitioning. Uh, we'll start with the Postgres partitioning history and we'll go through a few automatic partition capability which has been added into the uh, version 13. Postgres uh, introduced the declarative partition in version 13 and uh, they adding a new feature with every new release to the start with they had a single column partition then multi-column partition there were default partitioning then runtime execution time partition pruning which basically allows the performance of partition to be more faster uh, there were features like partition wise join partition level aggregate those has been added and many other performance improvement around the partitioning now, EDB had partitioning features since 9.4, which was inheritance based, but still it had a Oracle compatibility syntax support for that. Uh, from version 10, EDB moved its partitioning base from uh, inheritance base to the declarative partition, uh, which will give, of course, a great advantage of per performance. Uh, and it still continues to support the Oracle compatibility partition syntax and add many other features to make the life easy and to basically maintain the partition easy. So one, partitioning is good. It, it's kind of distribute your data and everything, but there is a cost of also managing the partition. Like you have created a partition, but then if you want to, uh, let's say, insert a data which basically doesn't currently fit into your existing partition scheme then you need to manually create the partition or add the partition for that particular uh, tuple or the partition key to get fit into the existing partition right and so it has a its own maintenance uh, with it what advanced server is trying to come up with is the automation around this what basically it means is like it, it automatically creates a new partition uh, and one need not need to be worried about the creation of partition at runtime. Uh, it's an easy way to manage the partitioning, partitioning schema. Uh, it's also easy to load and copy the data from old known partition table to the partition table. 
now considering you want to convert your existing table into the partition table first what you need to do is like you need to look at the uh, and try to understand the existing table data and accordingly you need to create a whole partition scheme to make sure that those data get fit into the newly created partition but with this automatic partition which got introduced on uh, advanced server 13 you need not need to be worried that much we will look at the example in the next slides to understand more that into detail so below are the automatic types uh, automatic partitioning types which has been introduced uh, there is an internal partition that's basically for the range partitioning uh, there is an automatic partition that's for the list and there is a partition and sub partition number that's for the hash now let's look at into detail like what exactly all means through the examples and, and more kind of understanding around it so internal partition is a extension to the range partition basically it creates a partition automatically if the given tuple doesn't get fit into the existing partitions now one need to provide an interval expression for the partition uh, interval close will basically decide the range size of new partition and of course and one can if the user doesn't want to continue with the internal partition one can alter the existing partition to convert that into internal partition or one can also alter the existing internal partition to get back to the normal partitioning now let's look at the example to see like how the syntax are different and what one need to do so in this example uh, i have a order table i have partitioned by range and the partition key is order data uh, now if you here i have specified the interval and it says one month so what exactly it means is like any new in partition which get created at runtime has to be the age bound of one month and uh, it, to the start i have created one partition here uh, which basically says the value less than first may 2020 now when i insert a data which is less than first may 2020 of course this will get fit into the existing partition which has been created so i inserted the data and when you do the select you can see that tuple got fit into the orders underscore p1 now this table oid colon colon range class is something postgres features which basically tells you like particular tuple belongs to which table in postgres every partition is a table so this way you can look at like where my particular tuple belongs to which partition now let's try to insert a data which basically doesn't get fit into the uh, create existing partition now i'm inserting date is 23rd june now in the normal scenario you will end up with an error like no partition found for the particular tuple but with the internal partition it will work and when you do the same run the same select you will see that the new partition got created at runtime There are other syntax around these which basically allows you to modify the existing internal clause or which will allow you to uh, remove the internal partition uh, and make again back, go back to the normal range partition. Let's look at automatic partition. Uh, automatic partition is very similar to internal partition but this is for the least partitioning so what it does is it automatically creates a partition if tuple doesn't get fit into the existing partition it creates a new partition for any new distinct value of a least partition key we can again enable and disable the uh, automatic partition using the alter table syntax now let's look at the example for this again i'm using the order table but this time i have partitioned by list and the partition key is a country code now initially when i'm cre creating a partition i'm creating a two partition p1 and p2 with the 
country code is IND and USA. And if you notice, only thing which has been changed here in a syntax is the keyword automatic, which uh, which has been added. So once this table is created and you describe, you can see there are two table, two existing partitions for the table. Now let's try to insert a record, basically which doesn't get fit in any of this partition. And uh, when I do that, in, after the insert, when you describe the table, you can see like there is a new partition got created at the runtime, right? One can again enable and disable this automatic partition using the alter syntax. So this was about the lease partition. Now automatic hash partition. Hash partition is actually different than normal list and the range partition. Like when you specify any hash partition, you basically don't run into an error like tuple doesn't get fit into the existing partitions because what exactly it does is like it just creates a hash value out of the partition key and make to find out that this particular tuple need to be stored in which particular partition. Here in this syntax, what it does is like if you are familiar with the declarative partition syntax, you must be knowing like when you if you want to create a hash partition, you need to provide a modulus and reminder for each partition. That might be a complex for the user. So what this syntax does is it is out those headache from the user. Uh, now what here it does is like when you say partition two and store in close, which basically allows you to specify like you want to create a partition in which table space. So here in this example, I'm creating a table with the partition by hash and uh, using the partitions two and so store in, in table space one and table space two. Once the table is created, and if I describe, you can see there is a number of partition which got created automatically. Now to understand more, uh, I'm using this query here, user tape partitions is a Redwood, uh, is a Oracle compatible view, which is in advanced server, which this view will give you a uh, detail about the partition uh, and partition and the sub partitions. So when I'm doing the select for these, you can see that there is a partition name C0101 and C0102, which both created automatically and uh, table space for both is table space one and table space two. Now the second part of this is like you can, one can also provide the same syntax for the sub partition, but here the power, it, it's actually gives you a more use case or powerful use case out of this syntax. So uh, let me run through the example. So here in example, if you see, I'm using the order table again. Uh, my first level of partitioning is partition by list and the partition key here is a country code. And I'm specifying this as an automatic partition. And the next level of partition is part, uh, hash partition and which is on order date. And I'm using the sub partition three as a close. For the initial, I have created one partition for IND and USA. So once this create table is done, and if I look at the view again, you can see like there are three, uh, there are three sub partitions for partition P1. Right. So it get sub partition get created automatically for the partition P1. Now. Let's try to insert a data which basically doesn't get fit into the existing partition. If you remember, we have created one partition with the values IND and USA. And now I'm trying to insert a record with the UK. Because we have specified that as an automatic partition, what will happen is it will create automatic uh, new list partition. And with that, because we have used the sub partition close in that, it will also create the three sub partitions for the particular newly created uh, partition. So in next select, this is how it's described. I have partition P1, which has basically three sub partition. And the next is 
this number that's something code created automatically for the uh, state code UK and it also has a three sub partition. Now this is something really powerful and if we kind of want to use combination of all uh, automatic partition it will really make life easy uh, and we might not need to be worried about the maintenance of the partitioning schemas. Now, there are more syntax around these where someone can also update the partition and the sub partition counts uh, using the alter table syntax now someone can also override the existing thing it's it's not like if i have specified the partition as automatic partition i cannot add the new partition manually uh, so here if you see in this example I, i'm creating a new partition uh, with the value aus and this time I'm overwriting the sub partition close. Uh, if you remember in the create table, we have used sub partition as three, but here I'm overwriting it with 10. So once I do that, and if I describe that, you can see that number of partition for the newly created is 10. So this all it works with other uh, syntaxes like split partition and add partition and uh, exchange partition as well. So yeah, this, this is an automation of a partition which has been added as part of uh, Advanced Server 13. And I think, Rusha, uh, this, this builds on a core post, new Postgres capability too, where the addition of new partitions, the, the locking of that behavior is greatly optimized, right? So this, when, when we build on this and automatically create new partitions, this is not with not involving heavy locking is that right yes uh, so i mean to get more inside like we use the autonomous transaction that's basically feature available in advanced server uh, if someone coming from oracle they might be aware of this feature what it does is it's kind of run as an independent transaction so when someone does the insert it intern and if it finds that tuple doesn't get fit into the existing partition it runs the create partition into under the autonomous transaction so uh, that will help us to uh, not holding a heavy load can you full screen this so we can see it better oh i'm really sorry i didn't realize that thank you okay. So next feature is something about the EDB loader. Uh, like every database vendor, Enterprise DB has uh, its own tool to basically bulk copy the data from the file and EDB loader is uh, available uh, with EDB advanced server for that. It has a kind of similar uh, functionality as SQL loader. Uh, here, it, one of the frequently asked requested feature uh, which our customer ask very frequently is uh, duplicate row aboards uh, what exactly it means is like uh, now in the normal case when you try to load data from csv file and if your table has a unique index and whenever it finds a duplicate record it just roll back whole transaction and you end up with no row getting load onto the table uh, but with this new feature, uh, one can specify that uh, handle conflicts at true into the uh, control file. And what basically it will do is like whenever it finds the conflict, it will add the new record into the bad file and uh, continuing loading the other records. This is basically similar to how it's, it's done for the own conflict do nothing feature. That's a Postgres feature. And exception here is like we rather than uh, doing nothing we record the bad rep, uh, record record the records into the bad file yeah apart from this whole feature there are many other features which has been got in into the uh, advanced server 13 it was kind of impossible to walk through all in this short time frame so i just 
try to list down here in one slide and basically you can see like there is a uh, more aggregate function support on version 13 like state modes and medium uh, there is a support for parallel and no parallel option into the create table and create index uh, there's also a using index close uh, support for create table and alter table there is a more enhancement around the adp spl language that's a oracle compatible pl pg sql language uh, there are announcement around the adp loader to insert uh, to do the multi insert and many other features which has been uh, listed down here if you are interested to know or read more about it uh, feel free to go to the website look at the release notes and if you have any questions or concerns please get back to us on this Uh, Mark, you want to take it? Sure. Back? Yep, I can do that. Um, okay. So Molly, if you make me presenter again, then uh, I can take it from here. Yes, one moment. You should have screen power right now. I like power. <laughs> it's about power to Postgres. <laughs> Power to Postgres. All right. So I think, you know, in summary here, before we go to the questions, um, really want to emphasize, you know, Postgres is getting more, it's getting faster, much more capable. TPS improvements, I really raved about them. The parallel vacuum, um, you know, of indexes, much, much faster. Um, things like you know the improvements in partitioning the improvements in data loading security and consistency so the pg cat check the 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 lib pq with channel binding uh, all of those things are just kind of pushing postgres forward towards more and more advanced workloads much greater reliability much much improved manageability also i think which is really the you know things like pg cat check the work on uh, vacuuming for um, you know uh, append only tables um, uh, is just it's it's really important because it takes it takes more and more of the rough edges away that um, that uh, that that have made Postgres in the past maybe a little weaker. But when we now look at where Postgres is being used, it's just by now it's all over the place and. Uh, this is kind of a clear demonstration why uh, you know Postgres is really winning uh, the race in uh, in the relational database field. So when I'm just just going briefly through uh, um, you know what we do at EDB in this context before we get to the questions and promise it'll only be three or four slides here. Uh, we're really focused on on helping to build Postgres and push Postgres further further. We bring a lot of expertise to the table and education. That doesn't just mean training. That means, you know, having people like Bruce uh, work as an evangelist with our customers, with user communities, um, having people like Rucha being available to help you figure out how to use Postgres in, in the right way. Um, just, uh, you know, we've been very involved and are remaining very involved in driving Postgres forward. So. You know, in the core team, we're, we're very represented. We have major contributors. And again, we make the distinction between major contributors and, and contributors because that's how the Postgres community looks at it. But they were very, very involved in Postgres and in key adjacent communities like uh, PG Admin, where, uh, you know, Akshay Joshi and the Shishvashi are very active. And obviously, Dave Page has been driving PG Admin forward for now. I don't know, 10 plus years. So, um, and then, you know, we, we've been working on pushing Postgres forward for quite a while. And, you know, it started um, early in 1986 with, uh, you know, Mike Stonebreaker and team designing it. Um, 96, really the, the birth of Postgres QL as a, uh, as an open source, uh, open source database. And, uh, Bruce has been with it for almost that long. 
Um, and then, you know, since the founding of EDB, we've been investing heavily into driving e the driving Postgres forward with things like the heap only tuples, materialized views, parallel queries, just in time compilation, uh, serializable parallel query, uh, et cetera. And it's one of the reasons why, when you look at the Gartner Magic Quadrant, um, EDB Postgres, which is really at the heart of it, is Postgres plus you know, some manageability and Oracle compatibility extensions. Why today it's in the magic quadrant, in the Gartner magic quadrant, as uh, the only open source based relational database that's, uh, that is still in there. If you go back through history, you'll see that others were in there, but today only Postgres is, uh, is mentioned in the Gartner magic quadrant for operational uh, uh, databases. So, um, as I said, we bring a lot of education to the table, and that's not just training, it's really being there to help all participants in, in, the, in the Postgres movement understand how to use Postgres, where to use Postgres, why to use Postgres, what it can do for an individual system, but also what the adoption of open source can do um, to, to a business. Um, been very successful in the market, so uh, I'm not going to go through every one of these customers, but I've personally worked with quite a few of them, and I know that they're using Postgres for higher-end systems, not just for small departmental solutions under somebody's desk. Um, so there's a big opportunity to learn more in these webinars. I think on August 12th, we'll do the next one uh, for how to migrate off Oracle to Postgres. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other resources. I think uh, uh, Molly's going to share them in the chat uh, with the links where you can go um, to get more information on the blog, on our bi-weekly Postgres Pulse series, which is a live call-in show, and then obviously on our, on our YouTube channel. Uh, so at this point, I want to open it up for questions. Molly, what do you got? Yes, so the first question we have was, can we use the combination of automatic partitions? Can we use a combination? Yes, I think that's what, Rusha, yeah. that's what you showed, right? When you showed the combination uh, of partitions and subpartitions in, uh, in your example, right? Yeah. Um, someone yeah. else, oh, sorry, continue. No, I was saying the answer is yes, like you can use the combination of all partition, automatic partition. All right. Someone else also asked, um, when will the vanilla PostgreSQL 12 training be released? Will there be a training for it? As far as I know, we should have that, but uh, um, make sure we record that into the questions and uh, we'll share the link in the question answers. But uh, as far as I know, that, that Career, that training should be available. All right. Another question we had was, does the runtime partition creation require an exclusive table lock? They're thinking about potential blocking of transactions. No, so as, sure. as we told, like the runtime partition creation does happen under the autonomous transaction. Of course, like adding a new partition has to create a lock, but it will be for a moment, not the lifetime of the query. Okay. Yeah. Someone also asked, can we convert to just, part just, in there, just for everybody to understand, autonomous transaction is a concept, program autonomous transactions is a concept that a lot of Oracle users know. It's not something that exists in core Postgres, right? There's a, there's a, let's say, a, an expensive workaround um, to, to, to simulate that capability, but the autonomous transaction is something that's available in EDB advanced server, and that's the mechanism here that is used to automatically create new partitions behind the scenes without significant locks. Okay. We had a question come in. They said, for GIS needs, I'm assuming they're talking about post GIS, um, would it be possible to set an automatic partition based on a two dimension lo logic? I 
know. Yeah, uh, that's interesting use case. Maybe we should explore there. We practically seeing it, it can be possible, but we haven't tried it out. Okay. Bruce um, looks another... very pensive. Uh, what do you think, Bruce? Um, yeah, so a lot of the partitioning assumes a linear layout. And what the person's asking is in a two-dimensional layout, how would you map that? I, I don't know. The only way I could think of doing it would be to create some kind of hash on on the x y coordinates that would convert the the 2d into a linear number maybe um I, that's the only thing i could think off the top of my head but somehow the 2d i'm afraid would have to be smushed down to some kind of linear cal in number uh, and i think hash would be the obvious way of approaching it okay so definitely there's room for people to learn more on this, see where people go with this. Another question we had was about features. Um, and I think this is a wondering about future features. Will there be a feature to automatically shard partitions across a list of table spaces? And the example that was listed was multiple S3 buckets. Um, yeah, we, we've been working on the sharding thing for a couple of years. Um, although it sounds like the person is not asking for multiple servers, but they're, mul they're asking for multiple storage locations. And that is possible because you can create your partitions on different file systems, and the file systems obviously could be on different devices. I don't believe Postgres would function in an S3 bucket because <laughs> Postgres assumes that the data is um, efficiently openable and scannable with sequential random reads and writes and stuff. And F-Sync, I don't think an S3 bucket can do that. I, I think there's, I thought MySQL had some kind of capability of doing that, but I don't know of any work on S3 buckets themselves. Yeah, not nothing significant. I mean, there's a a way to read them like text files i believe with a foreign right. data wrapper you can from a data wrapper them yeah sure. but that you might not that's, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an approach yeah but it doesn't scale because you have to ingest them completely into memory right right Which and it's going to write the whole thing out again yeah 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 so uh so i think i think the the part of the answer is yes right the way the way rushup said it you can distribute the data automatically across multiple table spaces and you can have different mount points for the table spaces on different devices but not with s3 all right good to know so we have time for one more question and this question is can we create primary key on non-partition key and then they listed any facility like global index <laughs> So uh, I put out a blog entry about Global Index, I think it was three weeks ago, um, kind of exploring, uh, we had a big discussion a couple of months ago about Global Indexes and tried to explain why you would want to use them. Um, right now, I don't know of any work being done on Global Indexes, particularly because uh, the problem is that once you create a Global Index, you're now centralizing all of the all of the data access to the index from all the partitions into one place. And the reason you partitioned was to spread things out. So you're kind of like doing both. Um, I would recommend taking a look at my blog entry, which I think was three weeks ago. And then if you would like to post a comment there, uh, momgen.us, uh, I'd be glad to answer it. And I understand what you're saying. Um, you can create a primary key if the primary key does span the partitions. What you're asking for is a primary key that's global that doesn't. And the blog entry does talk about that use case is not currently being supported, why you might want to support it. It's pretty complicated. Please read that and let me know what you think. Yeah. And there are, there are there is some, there's another blog out there. I can't remember if it was Hygo, whoever published it, like a workaround with store procedures and triggers, et cetera. But the performance is likely to be not what you expect. So Yeah, I did mention that in the blog that you can create a secondary table 
where you're doing the checks there. But as you're saying, Mark, it's not going to scale. It's centralizing all your data in one place. It's going to be big. It's going to be contentious. And, and that's why, yeah. So it's, it's a pretty complicated question. And the reason it's complicated because every other database who implements it has a lot of problems implementing as well efficiently. So we, we know it's a big hornet's nest and we're a little hesitant to get in there, I think. Okay, so that is all the time we have for questions today. For any questions that went unanswered, they will be posted on the landing page for this webinar once it goes up on the website. So check and either today or in the next 48 hours, it will be available. Thank you all for joining us for the webinar and we'll have the recording and the slides to you as soon as possible. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.